Hello and welcome everyone to this edition of The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Uh, thank you to everybody who hopped on here promptly. A uh, big shout out to the Fraser Valley where it is 5 p.m. And sometimes I forget just how big Canada is, but thank you, Kevin, for reminding us. Um, and yes, it is raining in Southern Alberta and parts of Saskatchewan, which is pretty cool. Uh, here in my neck of the woods, uh, there is a whole bunch of hay going down so it looks like we might be dry this week um, but I'm not sure I completely believe the forecast uh, just quickly as we get rolling um, as always thank you for joining us and if you do collect those CEU credits make sure you head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist and let us know you watch the broadcast so you can collect those CEU credits um, shout out to Scott who says it's that time again pencils and paper are out. This is going to be one you're going to want to take notes. Thankfully, though, you can also re-watch the broadcast. Um, that's good, too. Oh, and Kara, my colleague Kara, who is in Southern Alberta, 22 mils. Um, hard to believe. I didn't think, actually, your rain gauges were that deep. Kara, to be honest. Okay, um, let's get rolling with our sponsors before we bring in our guests. Tonight's episode of The Agronomist is brought to you by Adama Canada, Real Egg Radio, and the Pest and Predators podcast. Adama Canada, while other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Okay, and with that, tonight's topic, we are talking in-crop nitrogen applications in corn, and I am absolutely pleased to have uh, Greg Stewart with Mazex here in Ontario, and Elizabeth Karpinchik with Tone Egg. How do I say your last name, Elizabeth? Is yeah, that, that was right. Karpinchik, yeah. Oh, Karpinchik. yay. Yeah. Okay, good. It's, it's Elizabeth's like a lot first of letters. time here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, it is. I like it, though. So welcome here, and welcome here, Greg. Hey, good to be with you. All righty. Okay, so we are uh, we are talking nitrogen, and this is a tricky one uh, for Manitoba, especially uh, and the West this year. But so, Elizabeth, I will start with you. Give us an update on where seeding and planting is at in southern Manitoba. Okay, great. Yeah. So I think they're reporting sixty percent of the acres are in. So obviously, none of those people are in Morris and. Um, so we've got guys who are chugging away, clipping away, finishing, and then we've got other guys who are really suffering. Um, the guys up in the interlake are doing their best. The guys down in Varus are dealing with a lot of flood debris, a lot of burning mm-hmm. now, a lot of wet logs, et cetera. But the crops that are in have emerged very quickly, very even, it looks like an excellent stand, so. Right. So what? What's in? So Calvin, my coworker, is near Altona, so in South Manitoba. He said he finished up seeding on Friday. He was putting in spring wheat alongside his neighbor's winter wheat, which was starting to head. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's a pretty <laughs> significant difference uh, for those that went with the winter wheat last fall, which was, if you think about it, it, it I mean that wasn't an easy decision either uh, last fall. So that's a that is an interesting one for yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean we we kept a lot of winter wheat that norm in a normal year we would have probably Take destroyed it, it because yeah you know it's really yeah. hard to destroy a crop when you're not seeding it so you just yeah some yeah. is better than none That's all right exactly. now greg yeah greg we're in uh i gotta tell you that whole you know knee high by first of july kind of thing i feel like it's gonna be like Lindsay high by first of july like we have some very large corn here in ontario and i hate to yeah. brag but it looks good yeah yeah, I, I, I hate to follow the Manitoba crop report is what I hate to follow because I feel bad about saying that uh, we are sort of in the little garden of Eden here in the east. Uh, Ontario crops look really good. I was in corn that I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to bend down much to uh, be almost knee high today. So yeah, yeah, we got, yeah. Uh, we've, we've had a, we've had a nice go. Yeah, absolutely. So now, of course, so we do have two different scenarios entirely, but I don't think any growing season is ever the same one over the other anyway. But tonight is all about making this in-crop decision and the factors that go into it and what what we're going to take into consideration. So uh, just quick, some quick updates here. So Jason Vogt, who's uh, South Central Manitoba, he says 85 to 90% seeded. Um, I have heard from other farmers in the area for sure that are saying, you know, what, what, 
they were going to get in is in, um, and and that's probably it. Um, and then let's hope uh, that the flea beetles and that stay away. Um, and then there's some people with zero acres in, which yes, okay, that hurts. Okay, uh, we're we're gonna hope for some some drying winds and some warm weather. All right, so let's talk about nitrogen, Greg. I, I, what, I do want to start with um, OMAFRA's decision. They're not going to be doing the nitrate testing. Now, I, I moved to Ontario only six years ago. I had no idea this happened. We don't really do this out west. So just very quickly, catch us up. What, is, what did OMAFRA used to do um, or, or what do farmers typically do and agronomists do this time of year uh, for the corn crop? Yeah, so a little bit of a little bit of historical perspective, which unfortunately I'm old enough to be able to give to you, is that uh, when when we started looking at soil nitrates, you know, there, there's there was sort of two, a, a couple of different schools, and and the school that we sort of latched onto within Omafra is doing soil nitrate testing to try to track trends in the season season to season variability in the amount of residual nitrogen that, that would be available in the field, right? And, uh, and you know, some argued that that's really where site specific or precision nitrogen management was gonna take us. It was going to adjust the amount of nitrogen season to season, and there would be more opportunity to win there than trying to adjust it spatially within a field. And so, yeah, the OMAFRA group, uh, started doing these annual soil nitrate tests to try to find, oh, this is a year where it's been cool and rainy and backwards and our residual nitrate is low, so pour it at it, right? Or this is a year where it's been warm and dry and mineralization's been higher than normal, and so maybe you back off. Trying to track these season to season variabilities. And I think to be fair, the, uh, the, uh, the amount of brilliant seasonal winds. Oh, you know, this is a year where we clearly can all drop back 40 pounds, or this is a year where we can all add 40 pounds more. Yeah, it was never that big of a win for Omafra. The, the season, to season, season to season differences were a little more subtle than we had hoped for mm. uh, 20 years ago when we started it. Right, and so, so one of the clips I have, which we'll go to in a little bit, does put some of that in perspective as well in that, um, you know, OMAFRA did go from, you know, several sites down to about 20, um, try and try and sort of hone in on where they could potentially match up some of these differences. But the, the nitrogen question and exactly this point of how much is already there, plus how much you added at seeding or, or planting, and then to try and make that next decision, which is what's my yield target? What's a realistic yield goal? Is that still realistic? And how much do I add? So that is that is the crux of what we're going to wade through tonight is how do you come up with that magical number in the in-betweeny spot? So Elizabeth, I'll, I'll go to you. Um, uh, Kara says, does the 40 pounds count for humans too? Um, no, that was COVID. Okay, so Elizabeth, <laughs> Elizabeth I'll go to you. What right now um, are you working with farmers? What are the biggest questions on nitrogen coming from your farmers right now? So, so because our, our, our seeding season is so compressed, we had a lot of guys who were wondering, like, how else can we apply this nitrogen? So we're looking at if we can't apply it, like if we want to save time at seeding, can we split that application up? So we're not putting all of our nitrogen on right now and we don't have time and how late can we push it? So we were looking, mm. um, that's why these corn nitrogen trials that we did from 2017 to 2019, is really great data to have that we can look back on. So um, looking at these trials, like we can easily split that nitrogen application. We can go in V4 to V6 and expect no loss in yield. So if you're thinking about seeding in minutes rather than days, you don't have to put all your nitrogen down. Just get your seed right. in the ground. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so now, <laughs> Greg, what is the, I mean, it's hard to speak in total generalities, but in general, how much are our farmers going to put down with the crop at on the planting pass, either as a percentage or as, or as pounds, maybe percentage is easier. Uh, 
Yeah, if we if we if, if we try to boil down a, a typical Ontario Quebec case study, uh, which of course will be untrue for almost everyone that's listening, but yes, nevertheless, it's, it's it's not a bad average. <laughs> It'd be sixty pounds broadcast, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. So that'd be twenty gallons of UAN or or sixty pounds of N broadcast as urea. Uh, so I think sixty pounds up front is a pretty yeah, case study average number. And then on the planter, maybe somewhere between three and 30 pounds on the planter uh, to go with that, right? And that would be that would be a classic. I mean, we'd have all sorts of other possibilities, but I think 60 pounds up front and between three and 30 pounds on the planter would be sort of a, a middle of the road option for a typical Eastern grower. And then, now, and then coming back and side dressing or top dressing or late side dressing the remainder. Okay, so that's my that was my next question. What is sort of the the earliest that that top up starts, and how late are would you recommend someone still top up some N on this corn crop? Mm-hmm. Uh, I would suggest that there are many growers that like to start side dressing at V3 uh, quite quite okay. early in the in the window, and and they traditionally would be growers that perhaps have have maybe shaved back. Maybe they'd be 30, 40 pounds up front, and for sure just three pounds through the planter, and so they want to get out there early with their side dress. If we push my case study to 130 pounds of total end up front, then those guys feel quite comfortable in waiting to the 20th of June before they would lay down their their side dress or top dress uh, end. So a a bit of a wide window, depending a little bit on how much end supply you thought you had laid down up front. Right. Okay. And so that's where I want to go. I'm going to go to our first clip. This is Ben Rosser from a couple of years ago, um, sort of laying out what Omafra was doing with some of these nitrate tests, because he does get into a little bit of what your parts per million are and how that might inform the decision. So um, definitely want to talk about that because we're certainly hearing, uh, we talked about it on the word last week, that fields with a history of manure or red clover are showing some really impressive nitrate numbers right now. So uh, something to think about. So Jay, if we can go to the clip with Ben Rosser talking uh, nitrate levels. Hey, now we're back in the classroom. Uh, you've been out in the field doing a lot of nitrogen work and uh, <clears throat> you just released your survey uh, of nitrate, your nitrogen survey this, uh, this week. Tell us about uh, how it's changed over the years. You used to do an annual survey, but now you're looking at specific sites, right? Yeah, that's right. So in the past, uh, OMAFRA would go out, you know, typically first week of June timing, go out to maybe 80 or 100 fields where there hasn't been any applied nitrogen. Uh, just get an idea where background soil nitrates are like a little bit before side dress timing. So that's how we did it in the past. Uh, we have a recent project now, it's a GFO as well as GF2 funded project, where we have about uh, 20 locations across the province where we're actually trying to track nitrates from say the May 1st time frame up until about the beginning of July and see how those values change over the course of spring. So instead of the 80 to 100 sites before, now we're looking more closely at about 20 sites. Right. Now, a lot of talk about nitrogen out there right now. I mean, it's been a ragged spring, uh, cold, wet, you know, corn going in in all kinds of different situations. We're coming up to side dress timing. You've got some informa- information here on the board um, that really tells a story about what's what's happening in the field and what's going to be available. Yeah, so certainly, you know, it's been a cooler than normal uh, spring, what we normally see. And, you know, nitrogen release in the soil is temperature dependent, so there's been big questions, you know, how much nitrogen is mineralized in a year like this where it's been cooler. So if you look back at historical results here on the chalkboard from our past PSNT surveys, you know, we have results from 2013 up until this year in 2017. You know, a general range that we normally see based on past surveys would kind of be in the 11 to 12 ppm range. Uh, 2015 was off the chart, we were 20 and that's exceptionally high. Um, but this year when we looked at 2017 results for you know, the first week of June, uh, we're at about an eight. So we're certainly below where we'd normally be uh, this time of year based on past surveys. Yeah. Now, what do you, what do you attribute to that, uh, to Ben? But obviously that, you know, that weather, right? Yeah, so certainly it's been cooler than normal and just that nitrogen has been a lot slower to break down because those, you know, soil microbes that have been slower to, to uh, 
to release that nitrogen work on the work on the soil and residue and that sort of thing. Right. So, PSNT timing is really important for guys who are going to do side dress now. Um, when you look at that number, what do you tell farmers who want to know, hey, you know, Ben, what should I do? What's, what's my next steps? Yeah, so if you've got a number and you've gone out and sampled at the right time and have gone in a field where there hasn't been nitrogen put out previously, uh, then we'd point them to the PSNT recommendations we have at OMAFRA. Um, there was an old table where it was just PSNT values and what a nitrogen recommendation was. But back in 2015, there were some revisions to that. So now there's also a yield component to adjust the, uh, the nitrogen recommendation for a given PPM value also depending on what your expected yield will be for that field. So here's a look at the table. We have uh, soil nitrate PPMs in the left-hand column. So that's the lab result you would get back if you've submitted a, a soil nitrate sample. And then we have expected yields in the, uh, the other columns. So just as an example, if you had a 10 PPM value from the soil sample you set into the lab and your long-term and maybe expected yield for this year is about 190 bushels per acre, your uh, recommendation based on these would be about 180 pounds of total nitrogen. So for example, if you've put 30 pounds down on the plant or a starter and you're going to top up that with the side dress applications, in this case it would be 150 pounds of uh, side dress application, the 180 minus the 30 pounds of starter. Oh, we do love tables. Okay, before we get back into our conversation, just wanted to send a shout out to our show sponsors, of course, Adama Canada, Real Egg Radio, and the Pests and Predators podcast. There is a new Pests and Predators podcast brought to you by Field Heroes every two weeks. So there is one going up tomorrow on realagriculture.com. Uh, and tomorrow's topic is all about spiders. And uh, my coworker, Brittany, uh, was writing it up for the site and informed us all she's terrified of spiders so that's so we didn't know that and i apologize Brittany, for making you write that one up all right okay um let's talk that nitrate test translating through to that side dress so elizabeth are you pulling nitrate samples right now or are you working off of fall data how does that work so during the trials we were trying to use the nitrate test, but it was actually like on our clay soils here, it was always coming back that we didn't need any top up, which was actually accurate at the end of the year. So it was. Oh, so maybe it does yeah. work. So yeah, I mean, so the clay soil here is really holding on to a lot of that nitrogen that we're applying. Mm -hmm. And we, when we were doing these trials, like there was very dry years. Right. So we're not doing any top up nitrogen testing what john hurt is recommending for guys who are worried about nitrogen loss is just put a nitrogen rich strip and then right if you can see it you need more nitrogen right but that's so, somewhat reactive that's, that's which so we have practical. talked about <laughs> john, is, is like, john is practical to yes. a fault <laughs> come on we it's, need more science than that <laughs> the thing is is like when you have a farmer who is still seeding we're spraying mm -hmm. for flea beetles and we're worried about nitrogen. Like we're not, like we're doing our something yeah, else yeah. again. No, I, right? uh, yeah. yeah, I get you. We we preach the same story. Do not get bound down by trying to get your nitrogen on. Get the crop in the ground and deal with nitrogen yeah. one of 17 other ways later right. in the right. year, right? But I guess right. my question for Elizabeth, my, my question for Elizabeth is, do the fall nitrates work for you or right. or when when all I see on the news is canoes in southern Manitoba, how can a how can a fall nitrate test hang on to and be a reasonable value when everything's covered in water? You know, we're does your nitrogen learn this does your year. nitrogen not go down like it does not in Ontario? In the, when it gets, not in the clay, when like it, not in that okay. red river clay. It really just yeah. So I've got just sits there. I've got fields in Morris that were underwater for weeks and we applied in hydras in the fall. So we're going to see, we'll find out. Right. Nice. Get, get yeah. me back yeah. on at the end of the year. I'll yeah, tell there you. we yeah. go. Okay. I'll yeah. Be... We will absolutely have yeah. you back in October, yeah, November. Yeah, because that's, that's a real question. And, and how are we supposed to know what happens to nitrogen in the soil that's been underwater for a month? Right. Like, right. Right. So. Yeah. And so well, that's a great question. Yeah. And so, so Greg, I mean, in Ontario here, we don't, we don't pull and samples in the fall because it, it doesn't tell us the story. Oh, we yeah. pull them, you know, in the spring yeah. and, and ahead of this. It's, so 
It's the magical oh, dividing line of the Manitoba Ontario border, right? Yes. <laughs> things it, there are some things that just here. don't work it's, after yeah. you cross over that border. You know, it's, it's cold here, so that night just sleeps and... for the winter. You know, just sleeping, it'll wake up later. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's all good. Bad. So, so I think it drills into our question for this year: Why would we be seeing relatively high soil nitrate tests in Ontario, at least based on the early samples that we've pulled? And I think some of it is that is that we just haven't had either in April or May any of those excessive uh, rainfalls where you would have had a wet weekend and the soil would have sat saturated for a whole week. April and May have really not been that wet for us. April was April was not warm, but it wasn't wet. And and similarly, May was not terribly wet. So I think some of the reason for our elevated nitrates in Ontario is that we just haven't had water to either flush nitrates out or have them denitrify sitting on some of our heavier ground. Right. So and and anyway, the nitrate an intriguing question. Right. And the nitrate test is about what is being what's been mineralized and what's essentially available mm -hmm. in the soil, right? But that means if it's available, right. it could be lost to as you said different uh, different factors either leached out of the soil profile yeah. or denitrified. And and I think that, yeah, to, to sort of repeat myself, what accumulation of nitrate we had out of the April and May period, we hung on to because we didn't have right. uh, rainfall events that pushed it down or caused saturated soil. So, uh, <laughs> and, and I guess the only other thing that I should tackle maybe that Ben mentioned is that you know sort of this idea that the soil nitrate test was originally designed for just sampling soil that didn't have red clover that didn't have manure that didn't have previously applied nitrogen well guess what if that's the only time you use the soil nitrate test is when you had a true side dress situation where you had 30 pounds on the planter and you would just sample into un uh, you know, unfertilized, unmanured, un anything soil, yeah. well, we wouldn't have any use for it, to be honest with you, right? Because yeah. we just have so little of that pure side dressing going on. So we've had to try to take the soil nitrate test and make it work at least as a bit of a guide in a whole range of conditions, including guys that have put manure on, guys that have red clover, uh, growers that have... Uh, you know, growers that have done a whole range of things, including put down 200 pounds of N on the 25th of April. So we're using right. the soil nitrate test as sort of a gauge. Okay, where are you at on the 13th of June? And right. it may be not as accurate as the original developers thought a soil nitrate test would be, but it still works to give us a guide. Okay, so to that question of land that has been manured or has a history of manure, because we've on this show, we've talked many times about the legacy of manure, right? At one shot's not going to fix a lot, but a history of manure does amazing things for soil. So for those acres that have a history of manure, um, or for those acres that had that a good red clover stand, we, now wheat peat saying and some other agronomists are saying there is some really high nitrate samples coming off. Do you trust those, Greg? Do you take that into consideration? Do you trust them enough to pull back what what you would advise growers to plant, to add? This is a big one. Yeah, well, it was really easy when I was a government guy to say, absolutely, I trust those. You can pull back. <laughs> when the grower has Mazex corn planted in his field, I have a little harder time telling yes. him to pull back. But yes, for the most part. For the most part, when you get those elevated nitrates, and especially if they're taken in this sweet spot, June 10 to June 15, uh, I, I tend to think if you've got very high nitrates, you've got to trust those and pull back. Okay. I, I think there is pretty decent evidence that you can trust those high nitrate numbers as being uh, you know, a good reason to back off a bit. Okay. Elizabeth, what say you? Yeah, I uh, so we work with uh, quite a bit of manure out here, and we work with some really high organic matter soils. So we often right. see those very high residual nitrogen tests, except in the fall, but you know, close your ears. And uh, what we do with guys is if you're going to put any nitrogen down, like we put on 
some some reasonable amount. So instead of your 130, 140, we're going to do like 50. So we're reducing, but we're not doing zero. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the practical medium because right. you have to and, trust and it, but <laughs> we have to trust the science, but also yeah. cover our but the other thing is I'm not getting out of bed to put on 10 pounds of N. Like we're that's just, right. nobody's doing yeah. that. Like, yeah, that's, well, that's a good point, Elizabeth, right? If, I mean, if you're going to side dress there, you should be really, I mean, it's not worth it for 10. So no, especially right. with yeah. what fuel costs nowadays. So, uh, so yeah. that is definitely a consideration now. Uh, so our Canadian cowman friend out in the Fraser Valley, um, sharing what things are like, because of course there are provincial differences. There are rules of course, in our, in our management plans and our nutrient management plans. Um, and so discussing there about how they have to pull, uh, post harvest soil test is required every three years to see how much N is remaining. And if it is, I, I get, the sense that if it is over a certain amount, it does trigger potentially restrictions the next season. Now, again, that's the Fraser Valley, um, yeah. which I'm pretty sure he tells us he gets six cuts of hay. So it's a totally different, <laughs> totally different world where he farms, um, still in Canada, but uh, very different, but um, pretty neat and pretty neat to see. And, and so this is, of course, this is one of these conversations, though, is that if we're soil testing, we're doing this for a reason. We need to know what's there. But mm -hmm. further to that point, we do need to trust what it tells us, it, but not necessarily fully at the expense of leaving zero and added on and potentially that risk of that crop needing it. So, so I mean, that it is a fine line. Now, Greg, how you have a slide and, and Jay, maybe you can pull this up. It's, it's sort of six factors that Greg knowingly said we could spend, if we wanted to cover all six, this show would be two and a half hours long. We don't have that much time, but I do want to walk through, we've touched on some of these, uh, but maybe just walk us through when you're advising growers, when farmers are trying to make these decisions and agronomists are trying to advise their growers, walk me through how all six of these things work together on this decision. Yeah. So let's uh, let's skip to number two, uh, the weather factors, because that sort of lines up with what we've been talking about, particularly in terms of rainfall, right? So the other option that has been talked about across many research and and uh, agronomic circles has been the idea that well, if you have a decent recommendation, let's say the recommendation, whatever recommendation it is, it comes back with suggesting you need 150 pounds of N to grow this crop of corn on this field. So could you adjust that simply by rainfall? So I don't have time to take a soil nitrate test, but I can look at my rain gauge, right? And so is there a chance that you could adjust side dress in crop nitrogen simply based on rainfall? Well. Uh, so a former University of Guelph uh, prof, Bill Dean, had a nice study and he essentially came back with that relationship, which is, you know, if you look at rainfall between the 15th of June and the 15th of July, that correlates pretty well that as you get more and more rain in that window, you probably should add more and more nitrogen almost relative to the the millimeters of rainfall. So that's a good example of something that we're trying to get our heads around where, where rainfall in a in a in some way could adjust the model that you might be using. And uh, and his model was pretty simple. Essentially uh, adjust your adjust your late nitrogen. Now the problem for his recommendation is well what what equipment do I have that I can put nitrogen on on the 10th or the 15th of July, right? But you know, you get around, you, you work around those ideas. It's the concept of that rainfall could drive your side dress nitrogen rates uh, almost as a factor independent of what your soil nitrate test might be. Okay, so question about that. Is that, is that the, a function of loss or a function of mineralization? How is, did he, did he get to the point where he explained the why or is it just that it works so just shush up? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both supply and demand. Yeah. That is, right. when you have right. a lot of rainfall, 
you may pull the supply down a bit, particularly on heavy soils that tend to sit saturated for a day or two. But at the other end of it, your increased rainfall pushes your demand up because the yields are going up. So it's it's probably a little bit of both short supply and increased demand when you have above average rainfall. Okay. I like it's my it. political answer. My political <laughs> answer. I'm you're sorry. Being, you're being very political tonight, Greg. I, um, <laughs> I hate being, I hate being political, diplomatic. but nevertheless, that's what I got for you. There you go. Okay. I like it. All right. Um, so we're going to move to our next clip. I'm very proud of myself for getting both of these clips in tonight. Um, just so the audience knows, I've stopped picking three. I now only pick two Ugh. and then I commit to actually playing them. Um, okay. So this one, so Elizabeth, this will be a lot of fun when we come back because these are the trials that we have referenced a couple times uh, tonight. So these went from 2017 to 2019. So so John Hurd is on this clip. He's going to uh, talk about what these trials were and then we'll come back. Um, I have dubbed this the uh, many ways to the thousand ways we can apply N in the corn crop, which is not a thousand, but it's pretty close. All right, Jay, if you can run the clip with John Hurd and Kelvin Hepner in Manitoba. Yes, indeed. Uh, the Manitoba corn and corn growers did, did a study this spring uh, or a survey of farmers basically to see how it is that uh, the typical Manitoba farm groups are fertilizing corn and really uh, show how farmers are exploiting how corn is different than other crops. There are only, I think, 13 ways of oh timing and placement to fertilize that we, we found in the study. And so I have my uh, our corn uptake pattern here. I see, I see that's on screen. So what we find that uh, uh, about 30% of farmers in the year this uh, survey was done uh, typically apply fertilizer in the fall. Uh, very common on the clay soils and that's fall banded ammonia. So they'd be applying nitrogen way out here on this, on, uh, if the chart extended. Uh, further 30% uh, typically apply nitrogen uh, at or before seeding, uh, broadcast urea predominantly. And then we, we had about 15 to 20 percent would apply uh, nitrogen at seeding, often urea in a sideband application. And then we have about 20 percent that apply nitrogen in season, either side dressed uh, anhydrous ammonia or 28 percent or what many farmers are, are trying and using now we're tooling up is dribble banding. So there is no one size fits all. There's a, a number of options. And within that, there's also different forms. One way that we've spoken here about accomplishing that split application is through simply using some controlled release fertilizers. That also accomplishes essentially a, a, a split uh, a supply of nitrogen to the crop. You mentioned we're seeing more of that in-season application, though, as, as has been done in the Midwest U.S. for a while. A while. Are, are we going to continue to see that trend unfold here? Farmers have the equipment, and because they can, they will. Uh, but uh, we, our research in 10 sites have, have not shown an advantage nor a disadvantage to splitting nitrogen in-season. We might expect advantages in those years when we experience early season losses when the plant isn't using much nitrogen but if we have all upfront nitrogen that nitrogen is vulnerable to loss if farmer if we have those conditions and farmers have the option to supplement in season that's where we would might expect those systems to shine or have some possibilities but in a normal year uh, we just expect that uh, uh, there's no yield differences it does, however, give farmers a chance to, to delay making that decision on how much they're going to put on and they can maybe react to uh, weather conditions. All I can think about is it looked windy and yet the mic worked really well. Great job, I was job, thinking Kelvin. the same thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> Typical wind. Like I can see the it's wind. Like, wow. I can't hear it. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty it's great. Windy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Before we delve into these trials and, and the many ways we can, of course, get in uh, to this crop, I do want to send out another shout out to our show sponsors, to Adama Canada, to the Pest and Predators podcast, and of course, to Real Life Radio, a Monday to Friday, 4.30 Eastern on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Okay. So, Elizabeth. 
I, I really liked, so that was in 20, I want to say 19. It was a little while ago. And, you know, John makes reference to, you know, not necessarily there being a lot of advantages yield wise, but maybe no disadvantages, except when there may be early losses. So I'm going to guess this year is one of those ones where if there was nitrogen put on, it was prone to early losses. I'm going to yeah. assume some of that nitrogen might have been put on uh, with some sort of protection, but not necessarily. So is this the perfect year for split application of N in Manitoba? So in the trials that we were doing, what we were seeing was two different kind of areas in Manitoba. We've got like the Red River Valley, which is all this heavy clay. And then we've got outside the Red River Valley on the El Mississippi Sands. There's a lot of corn grown. It's a lot of potato growers that also grow corn. And those guys on the El Mississippi Sands, it certainly would be a really great idea to be using those Y drops that they've already got and toss on some extra nitrogen. But the guys in the Red River Valley, they have a lot of nitrogen. They right. habitually put on a lot of nitrogen. We get a lot of manure. I would not expect them to see a nitrogen deficiency because of the rainfall that we've had. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yes. Dang, and, and that's that... interesting. I got, I'm coming to Southern <laughs> Why, Manitoba Greg? for a tour. I'm, I'm coming to Southern Manitoba for a tour. I'm, uh, I need to see these flooded fields that hang in there. That's, that's good news. They really do. The key, Greg, if you want to grow a few inches is you wear rubber boots and then you start walking on the clay and it just accumulates and you get taller and taller as you yeah. go across Platforms. the field. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I have experienced, I have experienced that actually. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I mucked up about 17 gas stations in southern Manitoba because <laughs> I only had one pair of boots and I couldn't get yeah. the dang clay off my shoes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's exactly No, the worst what is when your backup shoes also get really muddy. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then you still have to muck it up. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now, so we also talked about uh, the 13 ways that farmers are applying and Greg, is there a superior way to get that nitrogen to the corn crop in a split app? So the biggest philosophical challenge that we have in nitrogen management is that spoon feeding nitrogen sounds so good. It just inherently says, oh, spoon feeding nitrogen, surely that will yield 20 bushels more and save the planet and uh, anyway. The reality is that when you look at a bunch of data from across most corn growing areas, including what Elizabeth just talked about, is that spoon feeding wins occasionally, but on average, yeah, it's just not a big winner. And especially if you start giving legitimate cost allocation to, to equipment, diesel fuel, specialized equipment, manpower, you know, sometimes we just sort of ignore all that. Anyway, I, I, I'm not really trying to suggest that split applications are not good. But I think sometimes we get so excited about the concept of spoon feeding nitrogen, free applications with my drop tube system from the 1st of June to the 14th of July. I've tried to show that works. Occasionally, you'll have a really wet June you know, 10 inches of rain in June, and we can come back and drop tube surface supply UAN on the 5th of July and get a nice 30 bushel response to some extra in. But year in, year out, thinking that, this, that the, the spoon feeding approach wins, it just ain't there. Mm -hmm. All right. But it does sound good, Greg. Oh it yeah, just... absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and and I guess the other thing is that a grower, if a grower is a, well, I'm gonna, just going to use the word, I'm going to use the number 200 pounds of N, right? If a grower is 200 pounds of N and he's going to put it on 200 pounds of N all the time, right? And whether he puts it on 100 and 100 or, or four shots of 50, if that's his approach, there's very little chance to come ahead, I think. If a grower is willing to say, okay, I'm 100 pounds up front or I'm 130 pounds up front, and then I'm gonna use all the tools available, 
soil nitrate testing, rainfall, yield expectations, and I'm gonna to try to adjust what that top up number is. And in some years, that top up number is gonna be zero. Then I think you can have some win opportunities. But if, if, you're, if you're just a 200 pound gal and you're gonna put 200 pounds on all the time and no adjustments for environment or yield or rainfall or soil nitrate tests, then I think how you split it up is a tough, if, if, if you think you're gonna make all your gains by just splitting it up more, and still always end up at 200 pounds, I, 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 I'm I not a believer. I like Elizabeth, it. I need your, I need your comment yeah. on that one. Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah, Elizabeth, is yeah. he dead wrong? Are we no. gonna find yeah. no, no, you know what, like it's so funny, like I have a grower this year for the first time ever in his farming career, very successful farmer who's like, I have all this residual nitrogen. I, I can't put on 150 pounds. And I was mm -hmm. like, what? What do you mean you've always been putting on 150 pounds like yeah so he's been soil testing and then like but still stacking them on the side and never reading them like i don't understand like <laughs> well okay but that also does happen sometimes i can't believe because, it. like i because, like, well, <laughs> like, i can't believe it. but that's Cody, why like, that's why they I've hire been, you i've been soil that's sampling for him you. for years and i'm like you just ignore it every year like i do all this work yeah. and like so and, and I guess the other I, thing we should, if I, if I could just throw in one other yeah, idea, oh, right? Of course. That, uh, that at least in the East, uh, what we have sometimes missed is the growers on heavy soils are a certain group and the growers on really coarse textured sands are, a, are another group. And then you have all the sort of loam soils in the middle. Well, mm -hmm. the places where there's opportunities to make money by splitting and spoon feeding are on the heavy clays and the sharp sands and not so much in the middle on the loams where you couldn't lose a pound of nitrogen in Oxford County in Ontario if you, if you tried because it never sits saturated and it never leaches right. out the bottom. But, but in other soil conditions, they should be more tuned in to, okay, splits and, and, and other options will pay me more because my nitrogen is almost always at more risk. Right. So when, and Jason Vogt brings up a good point, also in Manitoba, uh, paying attention this year because nitrogen is so much more expensive. So absolutely, we have to bring economics into this, this equation as well. So, I mean, Elizabeth and Greg, I mean, you've both, there are farmers that, you know, they have a corn rate, they have a canola rate, they have a wheat rate. I mean, we have to simplify somewhere. And so maybe this year with the economic driver of just how much that nitrogen is costing, um, it really is well worth actually reading the soil test and using it to inform that decision. So um, I'll start with you, maybe Elizabeth, on the economics question. You know, are you, are farmers paying far more attention to the fertility discussion because of the numbers at stake here? Yeah, we had to redo a lot of fertilizer recommendations when prices just kept going up. How little, like how little can we do? Like how mm, much do yeah. we really need? Like this year, yeah, we're not trying to build phosphorus this year. We're not trying to do anything fancy. We're just, you know, just every single guy was just like, how can I save? save well, and it also has to be has to come in line with yield expectations as well and and my hope oh no no that's certainly not no no everybody has 100 percent <laughs> yield 100 percent yield of expectations no one's got a yield no i'm i'm the... not even joking i was like okay let's like we're seeding in june let's cut back fertilizer and farmers are like no 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 well Why, no then okay no. <laughs> because it might not we you might not get a frost till november it's fine that never happens yeah, but it yeah, might yeah, no. right like, so <laughs> Definitely. Now, Greg, no. I mean, we've got we've got really strong fertilizer prices, but we've got strong crop prices, too. So are the economics, I mean, economics are always part of the equation, but is that very expensive nitrogen having some farmers pause a little bit on on how much they put on in a top dress? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. You see, the problem, the problem is. The, the problem is, and I'm only going to talk nitrogen because I think farmers in the East have tried to, like you've talked about, Elizabeth, have pulled back on P and K and tried to make those, you know, as intelligent mm -hmm. and as rational as possible. Um, 
on the nitrogen front, no, the, the, the most, I, I think most growers realize that it's not the, although, although they love to complain about it and, and, uh, and I get that. I, I love to hear them complain, uh, but, but most growers understand that it's the ratio of corn price to nitrogen price that drives the rate. And if they've got their corn sold at $9, you know, the nitrogen price all of a sudden doesn't look as scary as what they thought it might have been, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and that's and that's science too, right? That it's the ratio that matters. Don't get scared off by a high nitrogen price if your corn price has doubled or tripled from where it was three years ago. So, so mm -hmm. and, and then of course, it's the other, well, Elizabeth, Elizabeth alluded to this, but you know, you've got a lot of money invested in a corn crop right and across the whole range from land costs to, to everything and so it's really difficult for a grower to pull back 40 pounds on nitrogen when he says i've already got 600 dollars invested in this crop uh wow that's a you, you know you've got to be you've got to be made of steel to look at that corn crop and especially i look at a corn crop that looks really good right it's going to yield 250 bushels and you know, someone could hit you over with a soil, uh, hit you over the head with a soil end test or any other possible information. Yeah, that's a tough call for a grower to say, yeah, I'm going to pull back 40 pounds of N in a year where I've got corn sold for $9 and it looks awesome on the 13th of June. So mm -hmm. I think there's some reasons to pull back, but it's it's tough. And I would say most growers are having a really hard time in the East. Uh, uh, to try to, to to pull back on end rates this year. Mm -hmm. It does well, and it doesn't. It doesn't hurt that the crop looks really good, Greg. It it does. Yes, and and yeah. and of course, the reality is in those fields where the crop looks really good, the many of us think, "Oh wow, I can't short that crop. It looks so good." The reality is maybe that that crop looks so good is also another good reason to pull back a bit right it, it, you yeah. know there's 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 a there's a possibility that that uh that you know that, that that having a really good you know that's that comes out of some of the canopy reflectance work some of the you know some of the uh green seeker type work in in that sort of work some of those fields that look over the top ndvi readings of green and lush they were the spots where you should actually have pulled back not added more right 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 so and yeah and you did on that slide that we did look at briefly you've got ndvi you've got nitrate tests we also talked there you did mention tissue tests on there do you greg do you put any yeah. stock in tissue test and then elizabeth i'm going to ask you the same question tissue test for n top up do you use them why or why not uh if you wanted to rank three possibilities a soil nitrate test and then an image of the corn crop, and then a tissue test, that's how I would rank them. A soil nitrate okay. test gives you more information, then maybe an image of the crop, NDVI, satellite something, and then I think tissue test actually falls below those other two options in my book. Okay, Elizabeth, same ranking or would you switch those? Too, too transient. Yeah, right. we, uh, we're basically only doing tissue testing for like micronutrient deficiencies or something like that, not for nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, wh what about NDVI and or drone footage, aerial footage, those sorts of things? Are you seeing an increase in that um, for fertilizer applications or for other applications? So I have a brand new drone and I love it, uh, but you can't see the crop crop is too small so i mm. did i set up some strips in oats and the oats are like you know I yeah. my hand okay here yeah they're, they're i like know it's big you know it's like <laughs> yeah big and yeah. i can see it from the road i'm like yeah there's the zero treatment i see it and then you send yeah. the drone up and it all looks the same you're like well right. dang it come on drone yeah. it's because there's too much brown right like they're not that right. smart they're just looking at a pixel and assigning a color right like so we're not mm -hmm. going to be able to use the drone until well past the time where you would be able to do anything about that but we right. intentionally did this end deficiency in the oats because we're experimenting we're experimenters right and uh, yeah so but i mean it's a good point though right i mean same thing with with leaving a, an end strip right or those sorts of things is often 
you'll learn something, but you may learn yeah. it too late to do anything this season. Yeah, and that's why that's why we set up this trial with oats because that's the question is everybody always cuts back and rate on oats because they might lodge or whatever. But we've been like you know creeping it up, and so we're doing a little experiment. <laughs> so okay, I like it. Yes. And oats, I also like that oats are are kind of cool again. Sorry, Greg. I know you don't care at all about oats. Uh <laughs> I eat oats yeah, no, every we're, morning. We're oh, a Cheerio so country here. Like, no. Yeah, Cheerios. exactly. I do too. I'm like a pony. I have my oats every morning. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're good. But it well, it's actually so it's interesting to me to see oats even here in Ontario. There's um, I mean, oats is a cover crop, just absolutely everybody. Oh, yeah wants them right um yeah. and and for forage and those sorts of things but then of course there's a cereal a cereal crop in manitoba really yeah. has gained ground which is uh pretty cool to see all right um now i will before we run out of time because we are running short here if anyone in the comment section i know we've got a good group following along um if anyone's got any questions for our guests of course uh, i feel like i have been monopolizing both of your time and asking all of my questions which i'm the host i am allowed to do so but they have um, been good questions so uh thumbs well, up okay thank me. you okay thanks i yeah. take a lot of notes and uh and yes. you know and work them in anyway these are i get to pick the topic and i get to pick the people um so i i have a lot of fun getting to do these things um which i should note next week we're talking forage so uh anyone following along or if you have anyone who should be watching that when we're going to talk forage i i think uh sean lets me have like one show a year that is focused on forage agronomy so I'm going to use that one next week. <laughs> I think forage is more important than that, but it's not soybeans, corn, canola, or wheat. So I lose. I only get one show. Um, okay. So, so Greg, here's, you did mention, uh, of course, you know, there is a window for adding N and then part of our challenge is the corn crop gets so gigantic. Um, even if we could potentially gain some yield, we just don't have the tools. So, so recap again how late can i go in mm. and and it well, be effective uh, let's let's set well let's not set the equipment question aside altogether but let's suggest to you that in the east at least we have a significant arsenal of high clearance drop tube type equipment right and so mm -hmm. so yep. let's say that that is a possibility for anyone that wants to invest in it it is a possibility right and, uh, and, and, you know, I sometimes facetiously say that I think everyone should own high clearance, wide drop equipment and just hope that you never have to use it because you don't get, you know, big rainy Junes or you don't get corn that looks like it's waterlogged and run out of nitrogen. The reality is if you've put 75% of your nitrogen down before the 20th of June, that last 25%, it could go on almost any time right up to tassel and wow. you would be okay dokey. Yep. Okay. It's, it's a, so 35% of the nitrogen still has to flow into a corn plant after tassel, right? Right. So, so that's a big chunk of nitrogen that still has to be taken up by the plant after uh, tassel. So, so if you were to save that last 40 or 50 pounds of nitrogen and trying to be strategic or or maybe not apply it at all, yeah, you've got a you've got a pretty wide window that right up to right up to well, I'm gonna say just before tassel, because no one really likes to put nitrogen on in no. tassel <laughs> corn, but there's there's a there's a huge there's a huge window providing you've got the bulk of your nitrogen down already. Right. That would not be true if you were trying to get, you know, 75% of your nitrogen down uh, and, and you only had 25% up front, then you're going to start losing yield if you haven't got more of the end down up front. But if you've got 75% down up front, that last 25% could run right up to, to tassel and you would not give up any yield in my opinion. You may not make any extra yield, but you don't think you're going right. to give up any. Okay. The only the only caveat would be the only caveat would be if you turn really hot and dry, and you're laying that UAN on a right. on a hot dry soil surface on the 20th of July. Do you have your fingers crossed that it will start raining that you will actually get that nitrogen from the soil surface 
into the plant. And That's a practical consideration, but if from a theoretical consideration, it should work as long as it rains and moves that nitrogen into the profile. Well, if we could control the rain, Greg, I probably wouldn't be hosting yeah. the show. I'll be honest. Um, I'd be a bedillionaire. Okay. Uh, good question on side dressing manure. So Elizabeth, uh, you, of course, you've mentioned and, and certainly some really great areas that have access to manure. So dairy manure, hog manure, whatever it may be. How late have you seen farmers experiment with putting manure on corn? I know I've seen some really I, neat stuff in Ontario, but I, I, I don't know about Manitoba. I have never seen anyone in crop apply on corn. No? We have a lot of um, we have a lot of rules here, so gotta... yes, there are a lot of rules in Manitoba <laughs> about poop. And the other thing is, is like normally, like yeah. you set up your lagoons to be emptied at specific times, so that would yes. be like yep. in crop, you would not expect it to be full. So it, no, the only times I've seen it is like emergency situations, right? And usually they'll do it on a cereal and not on a interesting. Corn. See, because I sort of imagine, especially like like hog manure or something, would I feel like there's you got those giant rows? Why wouldn't you put some? Manure yeah, but there, you right? got this big drag line behind you. That's just yeah, but like they'll well, bend and pop back up, right? No, Greg, am I crazy? I don't, I don't know. Am I crazy? Like, I don't know. I feel like, but uh, like most of the time, well, like if you're doing manure for corn, you're putting it on the fall, and then yeah. if you're doing manure in the spring, you're not doing corn. You're going to be doing canola, right? So okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, if you're drag lining, we have growers that drag line corn on drag line manure on standing corn, but they do it maybe at three leaf. Uh, they're they're yeah. trying to be, you know, if they have to get out there, they want to make sure there is no growing point above the ground that's going to get broken off by the drag line. So they would try to be really early, like three, four leaf corn. Now, if you're running tankers, we there's been some decent research in ontario running manure tankers and knifing nitrogen knifing manure down between corn rows and again try to eliminate some concerns about the practicality of it but in research plots that manure sort of added up to corn yield improvements just about the same as uan would knife between the rows like yeah. in in terms of equivalent pounds of nitrogen so yeah, you can do it. Uh, it's it takes us it takes a certain type of grower who wants to side dress manure on a tanker down through cornrows, but it, yeah. it has been done and yeah. and I'm sure is being done on at least the limited acres in the east. I think the other like barrier we have here is that, like quite a bit of our manure is pumped by custom applicators, and mm -hmm. there's only a handful of them, and they are right. divas. And they will not do a good job. They do a rush <laughs> job. They're gonna come in the middle of the night and they're gonna get it done before you can even say anything. And they're gone. Uh, like that's I just that's just how it's gonna be. So it's but like Greg, this... well, further to that point, Elizabeth, is if you've got equipment, you're gonna use it. So if you have the equipment or if or if manure if you're really passionate about being able to apply your manure at any time in the season, yeah. this might be something you could do, but you'd have to invest in the equipment to do it because i'm guessing the custom operators are not going to modify yeah. their systems for you yeah, yeah. okay and... yeah but it's it's yeah. it's absolutely doable you've got to probably change the tire configurations on your manure tanker you've got to invest yeah. in the right shank and cover yeah. so that the manure actually gets knifed in and covered uh covered, yeah. yeah it's uh yeah. you may not want to plant corn on your headlands so because you're gonna make a mess of it I'm but uh <laughs> But it's uh, it's absolutely doable. Okay. See, yeah. I'm not entirely crazy. I'm just I feel so like annoyed. we have other barriers. Like I feel like it's possible, <laughs> but I feel like there's just other barriers too. Right. We should probably be focusing on the other things we need to improve on, like actually reading our soil tests if we're having them yep. done. Than exactly. worrying about knifing in manure or drag line manure. I am though. It does beg the question, or or I'm always amazed by uh the resiliency of young plants like when we roll our pulse crops or our soybeans like you're yeah. literally rolling over them oh, and yeah. they do fine they do like, fine really they pop back quite, up it's they, great they pop back <laughs> up so it's yeah. kind of which is another remarkable. question we're having this year with our like compressed yes. seeding 
Mm-hmm. Nobody has time to come back and roll. So mm-hmm. we're just waiting. You can go till V3. Right. We're good. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Although you need a hot day, right? Then you need a you hot need day. You need a hot so day, yeah. So we've done this key. as part of the yeah. uh, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers on Farm Trial Network. The yeah. question came up with a grower and we did it two years and it was great. It worked out great. I, like we were all shocked at how well they stood back up. But yeah, it was a hot day. Yeah. And it's before V3. It was actually at V3 that we did it. Okay. So there you yeah. go. Cool. Yeah. So there we are. Okay. We are we are wrapping up. Thank you uh to Greg Stewart with Mazex, to Elizabeth Carpenchick. I'm so glad I got your name right. Uh with Tone Egg in Southern Manitoba. This is super exciting. Uh thank you to both. And Ray DeManco had a great point. He said we should have you both back in the fall and we should talk about how this season went. So and and see how it all turned out and see what the right call was. How late could you go in? How much end? Did any crazy farmers not put any top up and did it work okay. out that's okay. we'll have you back and we'll check yeah. well, and we'll see and, see and how your oath we could appeal we could appeal to all growers that if you don't do some checking you will be no smarter next year when you're trying to make <laughs> these right. decisions than you are this year if you haven't that's laid right. some strip down some yeah. check you you you'll well for some people it's not a big downside but for me if i'm not a little <laughs> bit smarter next year then we've got problems yeah. That's right. We only have so many growing seasons to improve, right? So we got to learn right something on. every year. So absolutely. All right. Yeah. Greg and Elizabeth, thank you so much uh, for joining me tonight. Great show. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, of course, to our show sponsors, Adam at Canada, Real Ag Radio, and the Pest and Predators podcast. A reminder to all, uh, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist to collect your CEU credits. And next week, yes, we are going to talk about forage agronomy. So get your questions ready. Um, and forage can include cover crops, everyone, just so you know. All right. We'll see you next week. Cheers, everybody.